Good morning, colleagues. So today, I want to put uh, processed food on trial for the cause of macular degeneration. And I'll play the part of the prosecuting attorney, and you guys will be the jury. How does that sound? Does that sound good? And uh, so we, uh, the defense attorney for processed food didn't show. Imagine that. Unless, ben, were you going to do that? Maybe. You, I think he's going to decline, too. So I, I think uh, you know, a defense attorney for processed food here thought he'd be crucified, right? So today, ladies and gentlemen, you will witness further evidence that age-related macular degeneration is caused by processed food consumption, and that it is not caused by aging and genetics as conventional ophthalmology would currently believe. What you're going to see is that macular degeneration was an extraordinarily rare disorder just 100 years ago and prior, and today it is of epidemic proportions all around the world in developed nations. And the only thing that's changed that can account for that is our diet. The other thing I'm going to show you today is that the same people known to consume the most processed foods also develop the most heart disease, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, stroke, cancer, obesity, and macular degeneration and that those correlations could not possibly occur by chance alone. So age-related macular degeneration, for those of you not aware, is the leading cause of irreversible vision loss and blindness in people over the age of 65 worldwide. Nearly one of three people over the age of 75 is affected with AMD today and has been since 1992. Globally, one of every 11 people over the age of 50 now affected. 20,000 people will be diagnosed with macular degeneration today. And tomorrow and the day after that, 20,000 per day. All right, so this is what the healthy macula looks like. It is just about six millimeters across, accounts for our central 10 degrees of vision, and of course, that's the most important part of your vision. That's what sees faces and stop signs, allows you to read and drive and, and do all those things. As it begins to degenerate, in dry macular degeneration, it looks like this. And then um, about 15% uh, of patients will go on to develop wet macular degeneration. And this is a progression of vision loss, so at this stage, a person would develop much more vision loss uh, and eventually if this undergoes scarring could result in what in vision that's like this on the left, these huge central blind spots. But the question today is this, is the difference due to diet and diet alone? And in seven years of study, what I will tell you is that I believe 100% that this disease is caused by diet and diet alone. Now, no question, genetics plays a role, but environment pulls the trigger, and that environment is our diet. All right, so now some of you may have heard me speak here a couple of years ago, but if you didn't, what do you, what do you suppose the lifetime risk of, de of developing AMD was back in the year 1900? Anybody? Sorry? Yes. So the answer is nearly zero. One in many thousands. And I'll present just a little evidence of that today. Um, but the question is, is if it affected one in many thousands in 1900, how did we go to nearly one in three affected by 1990? Because that's what happened. That's what we need to think about as we go through this today. So. After studying nutrition and understanding Weston A. Price principles back in 2013, I developed this hypothesis. It goes like this. The displacing foods of modern commerce are the primary and proximate cause of AMD. And the corollary to this hypothesis is that any ancestral diet will prevent and may treat existing AMD. Now, we're going to talk really briefly about ancestral versus westernized diets. Now, I know all of you here 
understand this, but let me just give you my perspective briefly because to me, an ancestral diet is any diet that existed anywhere on the planet before 1880. The reason I picked that number is because we had virtually no processed foods anywhere on the planet before 1880 with the exception of sugar in really small quantities. Um, 1880 is when we first got refined white flour, we got vegetable oils, the polyunsaturated uh, vegetable oils then, and then we got the uh, trans fats in 1911 when, when Procter & Gamble introduced those. And of course, as you know, those have overt overtaken our food supply, right? And of course, today, our westernized diet looks a lot like this, right? 600,000 food items that you can put on the American plate today. But if we break this down, what we know is that 63% of this is made up of those four refined processed nutrient deficient foods in the form of added sugars, refined white flour, primarily polyunsaturated vegetable oils and the trans fats, right? And you all know this is the recipe for metabolic disaster and physical degeneration, right? Okay, so let's go back to macular degeneration for a minute. Let me give you some perspective. I'm an ophthalmologist, and let me tell you about what uh, my profession believes about macular degeneration today. This is a statement from Joan Miller, who's the chief and chair uh, at Mass Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary. In 2012, at the American Academy of Ophthalmology, she made this statement. Quote, it seems that AMD is a complex disease that results from the interaction of genetic susceptibility with aging and environmental factors. Now, so all about genetics and aging. These are the huge two factors that ophthalmologists believe macular degeneration, degeneration is about with environmental factors being a distant diminutive third and of that most of that is considered to be smoking, that environmental factor. That's the big, big issue. Diet, very little role is what is currently believed. Now, this is a paper that came out in 2016 out of Bascom Palmer Eye Institute, major uh, ophthalmology training institution in the US and uh, regarding genetics of AMD. And the authors wrote this, currently 52 gene variants have been significantly associated with macular degeneration, 52, and the genetic component of AMD has been estimated at 45 to 70 percent. So up to 70 percent of this disease believed to be genetic. Anybody know what's wrong with this thinking? Everything. Everything. <laughs> Everything. Love that. Okay. What I would say is Faulty genes don't produce epidemics of disease, right? Okay, and I think it was said best in this paper that came out regarding an epi the epidemic of coronary heart disease, David Grimes at the Blackburn Royal Infirmary said it well. He wrote this, it is obvious that an epidemic cannot be due to faulty genes which have, have a stable prevalence over a long period of time. However, genes can have an influence on susceptibility, right? Does that make sense? It's exactly the situation with macular degeneration. 52 SNPs, right? These polymorphisms associated with macular degeneration, they set the stage for the disease. Genes load the gun, environment pulls the trigger, right? Okay, in two, it, last year, November of last year, 2017, uh, my little group published this paper. This is the beginning of the, the fundamentals for this hypothesis, and we're going to cover a little bit of this today. I'll just give you the, the basis of it today, but I want you to know it's there and it's available through our website. So let's go back to the hypothesis uh, proffered uh, uh, publicly in 2016 when I first presented it actually at this meeting in Boulder, Colorado. So again, it goes like this, the displacing foods of modern commerce are the primary and proximate cause of AMD. And most of you here probably know that I borrowed the term displacing foods of modern commerce from Weston A. Price, right? And probably most all of you here know Weston Price, but in, in case there is somebody that doesn't, let me just give the really brief review that Weston Price was a highly accomplished scientist, researcher, and dentist who in the 1930s spent the better part of that decade traveling the world, evaluating people on five continents, 
14 nations, hundreds of tribes and villages, and thousands upon thousands of people as they transitioned from their native traditional diets over to westernized diets, right? And what Price found was, first of all, that, that when people began to, to, to consume what he called the displacing foods of modern commerce, which he defined as refined white flour, sugars, canned goods, sweets, confectionery, and vegetable oils, they began to develop First thing was dental decay, right? And then that was followed by other degenerative conditions like arthritis and cancer, and they lost immunity to infectious conditions like tuberculosis, right? And today, we know, everybody in this room probably knows that processed foods now have been linked with all these diseases of Western civilization, right? Heart disease, cancers, type 2 diabetes, stroke, the list goes on and on, right? I understood this for the first time in 2013, and so when I did, this is what went through my head. Could macular degeneration be another one of these diseases of Western civilization? Might it be a disease that just follows processed food consumption? So let's go back in time here for a minute to 1920. There was 4.9 million Americans in the U.S. over the age of 65. The Social Security database has this data, right? So if the prevalence of macular degeneration in 1920 was the same as in 1990, which was 22.8%, then there should have been 1.1 million people with macular degeneration in 1920 if we only considered those over the age of 65. Well, guess what? Between 1851, when ophthalmologists first began to see the, the macula, and 1920, there was no more than about 50 cases of AMD in all the world's literature. Ophthalmologists had been using ophthalmoscopes since the 1850s. They had atlases, they were dil using dilating agents beginning in the 1860s, used six different dilating agents in the 1880s. They, used up, they had 200 versions of ophthalmoscope to look into the back of the eye. These are different models in use around the world by 1913, and yet, 50 cases of AMD in nearly 70 years of potential discovery. So it wasn't like they weren't looking. There's loads of evidence they were evaluating the retina, and, and they were astute clinicians. So, but today, 15 million Americans affected way back in 1994. It's estimated 196 million people will be affected with macular degeneration by 2020. Two million blind worldwide, both eyes, as of 2002, according to the World Health Organization, so I think that number's close to 3 million today, blind, both eyes, a travesty, yes. But, of course, today, as of 2009, 63% of the American diet is made up of processed food, right? This comes from our own USDA. The yellow slice of the pie there is our processed food. Why does the USDA uh, publish this? Because they know. They know this is a massive problem. They list it right there, processed foods, added vegetable oils, trans fats, sugars, and refined grains. Not reflected in our food pyramid, right? But they know. So let's look at macular degeneration because what we see in our data, and we evaluated 25 nations, is that macular degeneration follows processed foods worldwide. So we use proxy markers to track processed foods just like good nutrition researchers. And we used sugar and vegetable oils. Why sugar? Because it's in 74% of the 600,000 food items available in the uh, United States. Uh, and it's 21% of the food su supply. Vegetable oils, because it's probably in hundreds of thousands of our processed foods, and it's 24% of the US food supply. We believe this would track at least 90% of processed foods. So let's take a look at what happened. So I'll just review this briefly, which I presented two years ago. But this is the United States, and you'll see sugar in the blue rising from 1840 forwards. Total vegetable oils really began in 1880, um, but only at about two grams a day till about 1909. Uh, so you can see total vegetable oils climbing uh, uh, all the way up to 80 grams a day by 2010, right? Now these are split out in the red uh, 
as this is the what we call harmful vegetable oils, which is primarily the polyunsaturated oils. The tropical saturated oils are, are, are healthy. We don't see any issue with those. And so are the monounsaturated olive oil. So now, if we go back to this, the, the uh, macular degeneration is in the, the prevalence is in the green bars. Now, we know back here in 1900, we had virtually no AMD, right? And by the 1930s, if we could go through all the history, there was, it was a, on a very small scale. By 1970s, we are at epidemic proportions of disease. And the point here is that 30 plus years of consuming these processed foods, and we're at epidemic proportions of disease. That's what we see repeatedly. All right, this is Japan, which is the quintessential nation to illustrate this whole point. So we see sugar consumption back in 1961, about 50 grams a day. Didn't elevate that much, 80 to 90 grams a day in succeeding decades. But here's the huge problem. Look at the vegetable oils, the harmful polyunsaturates down in red. Nine grams a day in 1961 elevated four and a half fold by the early 2000s. Okay, now look at the macular degeneration prevalence in the green. So it's down there in the 1970s at 0.2% prevalence. By 2007, their prevalence was 11.4%. That's a 57-fold increase in the prevalence of AMD in just 30 years. Now, we can't possibly explain that with genetics and aging, right? In fact, any hypothesis you want to proffer to explain the causation of macular degeneration needs to explain data like this. And this is not the only nation that looks like this. But diet explains it, doesn't it? Processed foods, the, the Japanese processed, their, I mean, they, they began to consume processed foods over the last five decades. That's what's happened to them. Okay. This is Nigeria in Africa. This is a 100% African population. First, look at their sugar and vegetable oil consumption down there in the blue and red, respectively. Really low, right? And if you look at the first green bar on the far right, the AMD prevalence in 2004, that's 3.2% prevalence of AMD. Now, that pales in comparison to our 22.8% here in the U.S., and it should because they're processed food consumption is, in comparison, dramatically less, right? Okay, but that 3.2% was in Onicha, Nigeria. That's a metropolitan population of 1.1 million people. So guess what they have access to there? Grocery stores, processed foods, right? That's where they're getting the processed foods. Now, if you look to the right of that, that green bar, over at 2007, you see a little tiny green blip. That's a prevalence of AMD of 0.1%. That was in southwestern rural Nigeria, 0.1% prevalence. Guess what they don't have access to there? Grocery stores, processed foods, they can't get them. They're consuming a native traditional diet. Okay, these are African people. Keep in mind, 0.1% prevalence of AMD in Africans of southwestern rural Nigeria who can't get processed food when we look at this next nation, Barbados. Because the people of Barbados, the indigenous people, are of Western African descent, okay, all right? And the, in this study, this was a nearly 97% African population in this study. Now, if you don't know this, nutrition researchers around the world know that Barbados is a mecca for processed food consumption. Why? Because they import almost all of their food. Imported food is almost exclusively processed food. This is a lot like Greenland. It's a recipe for disaster. You can see it. Look at their sugar consumption. 140 plus grams a day since 1960s, which is more than four times the World Health Organization's recommendations. Their polyunsaturated vegetable oils down there in red, approaching 20 grams a day since the 1970s. This one was underreported. There, there are companies producing vegetable oils for them that did, did not report to the FAO, the Food and Agric Agricultural Organization of the United Nations on this data, we know that. So the, the vegetable oils are, un, are underreported. But so the people of Barbados have a, quote, world profile of metabolic disease, metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, 
uh, cancers, all that, right? Well, of course they would, consuming mostly processed food diet. Now look at their macular degeneration, 24.3% in the green bar. 243 times greater than the Africans of southwestern rural Nigeria who can't get processed foods. Does anybody want to argue that's about aging and genetics? <laughs> I didn't think so. Okay, so here's the Solomon Islands down in the South Pacific. These people are consuming mostly a native traditional diet. Look at their sugar, about 20-ish grams a day since 1960s. Look at their harmful vegetable oils, the polyunsaturates, zero. They don't get them. Why do they not get them? The big food manufacturers don't even want to sell down there. These are impoverished na nations, and they, they can't hardly sell their food down there. So these people are living off of uh, seafood, root vegetables, and coconut oil mostly. Now look at their macular degeneration. From 2005 to 2015, the uh, ophthalmologist that collaborated with us down there determined their AMD prevalence about 0.2%. That means we have 74-fold more AMD here in the U.S. prevalence than they do. But you can see the difference. Extremely low processed food consumption as evidenced by their sugar and especially the polyunsaturated oils. All right, the last nation I'm going to show you is Kiribati. This is an island nation 1,200 miles south of Hawaii. It's out in the central Pacific, middle of nowhere, 115,000 people. Um, look at their sugar consumption, pretty high since the 1960s, bouncing around, but 80, upwards of 120 grams a day. But look at their harmful vegetable oils in red down at the bottom. Once again, they don't get them. Now, over at the far right, the green bar at the very bottom, 2015, AMD prevalence, 0.2%. This nation of 115,000 people has one ophthalmologist. In 2015, he saw two patients with macular degeneration the entire year. I don't think I ever went a half day of practice in 24 years without seeing three or four patients with macular degeneration. But that's the difference. All right, so next we're going to see um, this link between diet, chronic disease, and macular degeneration, these, this comes from our own CDC, our Centers for Disease Control. So take a look at this. This is the percent of adults consuming vegetables less than one time daily uh, in 2015. So the darker colors, just uh, let's call that low vegetable consumption, right? Um, so we see that the low vegetable consumption is in the south, and we're just going to point out the south. And I'm going to use my home state of Colorado. I hope everybody knows where Colorado is there. Uh, it's hard for me to get the pointer, but my, oh, oopsie daisy, that, that didn't help. Let me go back here. Here we go. Okay, so I won't point that, that again. You all know where Colorado is. Um, so notice Colorado is amongst the highest consumers of vegetable oils. Um, this is the percent of adults consuming fruit less than one time daily. Notice low fruit consumption in the south, highest in Colorado, right? This is soda pop consumption in teenagers. Notice um, high soda pop consumption in the south, and Colorado has no data here, all right? But here we see gallons of soft drink per capita, high consumption in the south, right? Colorado amongst the lowest consumers of soft drinks. Okay, now this is food deserts as defined by the CDC, which is no car and no super, supermarket store within a mile. Why is that important? Because the CDC knows that if you have no car, no supermarket store within a mile, you're shopping at convenience stores. That's a recipe for consuming processed foods, right? So we see, again, food deserts dense in the south and really low in Colorado. So now we know where all the processed foods are being consumed, right? So let's see what happens. So here's heart disease death rates. Notice it's severe in the south and lowest in Colorado. This is high blood pressure. Highest in the south, lowest in Colorado. Diabetes prevalence. This is type 2 diabetes, so highest in the south again, 
lowest in Colorado. This is stroke, highest in the south, lowest in Colorado. And then finally, cancer deaths. Once again, highest in the south, lowest in Colorado. Okay, now we're gonna look at obesity. Highest in the south, and Colorado is the lowest in the nation. Seem like a pattern here? Okay, I brought you through that to show you this correlation. This is the percentage of people age 18 plus with severe vision loss. Why is that important? Because we know since 2002, 54% of the severe vision loss is macular degeneration. So where the darker colors are, that's where we have the most macular degeneration. It's worse in the south, lowest in Colorado again, right? Okay. And this is the U.S. counties in the top quartile, top 25% for both, both severe vision loss and poverty. Worse in the south, lowest in Colorado. Why is poverty an issue? Because in this nation, you can, cons you can purchase about 2,000 2, calories worth of processed food for about $3.50. That same 2,000 calories coming from whole food, meats, eggs, fruits, vegetables, grains, nuts, seeds, dairy, all that costs you about $13 or more. The studies show it. All right, that's a sad fact, and I hate the fact that that's the case, but, but it's reality. Okay, so here, we're gonna go back to this slide. This is the same slide, severe vision loss. All right, so if macular degeneration is all about aging, then what we should see is those people in the South must have the longest lives, right? So let's see if that's true. So here's the U.S. life expectancy for females. Notice that average U.S. life expectancy for females at this time, 81 years, and yet in the South, they're living to about 70 four to 77 years, about four or five years shorter than on, on average, right? And this is U.S. life expectancy by county for males. Um, notice again, the shortest lives in the South and the longest lives in Colorado. So let's go back to this. This is severe vision loss on the left and life expectancy for males on the right. So notice again, where we have the greatest vision loss, in other words, the most macular degeneration, we have the shortest lives, right? This is not consistent with the theory that macular degeneration is a disease of aging, is it? And if we're to believe that macular degeneration is a disease of genetic predisposition, then are we also to believe that the same people who consume the fewest fruits, the fewest vegetables, the most sugar-sweetened beverages, live in the most food deserts, and therefore consume the most processed foods, and who then develop the most heart disease, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, stroke, cancer, obesity, just happen to have the worst genetics for macular degeneration? Does that seem likely to you? I just want to show you very quickly. This is my home state of Colorado. Notice severe vision loss on the uh, left and life expectancy on the right, correct? So notice the counties in white are where the severe vision loss is the lowest, two point, less than 2.3% are the exact same counties where the life expectancy is the longest, 83 years. And the counties in blue where the severe vision loss is the highest, greater than 4.2%, in other words, more than twice as much macular degeneration, are the same counties where the average life expectancy is 74 years, nine years shorter for men. This is true, ladies and gentlemen, because macular degeneration is not a disease of aging. It's not a disease of genetics. It is a disease of processed food consumption. And that results in more chronic metabolic and degenerative disease, more macular degeneration, and earlier deaths, right? In conclusion, 
AMD was a medical rarity from 1851 to 1930. By the 1970s were epidemic proportions. Today, 190 plus million people with AMD. What changed? What changed is the displacing foods of modern commerce. The polyunsaturated vegetable oils, these deserve special mention. They're the greatest contributor to macular degeneration. These are biological poisons and I think the single greatest contributor to vision loss. But the big picture, ladies and gentlemen, is this. Displacing foods of modern commerce lead to macular degeneration. We've indicted po processed foods. Do you think we can convict them? Today, 270 people will go blind due to macular degeneration. They'll lose vision in their second eye due to this disease. I believe it's all preventable. For more information, come to our website, Cure AMD Foundation. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We're at cureamd.org. We give away all the information. Books are available for the cost of print, and I hope you all will consider this and become ambassadors in this cause. I want to thank the Ancestral Health Society, and I want to thank all of you. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. I'm glad I didn't have to play devil's advocate over there. Uh, all right, you guys are good. We're just going to go to Q&A. We have like about eight minutes for that. Linda Frasetto from San Francisco. So I'm a kidney doc, and a lot of what we do is vascular stuff. Um, do you think this is a vascular problem, or is it an inflammatory problem, or is the biology of AMD not well known. I mean, I don't know anything about it, so I'm kind of asking. So processed foods are, are part of the cause, but if you had to talk about the biology of it, where, what do you think the pathophysiology is? Okay, sure, great question. Um, do we have four hours to cover this? <laughs> In a nutshell, I'll say this. Uh, it's extraordinarily uh, complicated, but one of the first things that happens is that we lose retinal pigment epithelial cells. They somehow get sick. They support the photoreceptors, which is the rods and cones. Um, sandwiched down in there is Brooks membrane. And Brooks membrane separates the vascular layer from the photoreceptors. And that Brooks membrane thickens and becomes less permeable and it calcifies. Um, and then the choriocapillaris, which is the vascular layer that nourishes the retina undergoes attrition, it, it undergoes occlusion. So what we see is, is we see a vascular disease in that choriocapillaris, and I think that's where the vegetable oils and the trans fats play a huge role. So we see all of these things together, come together to result in retinal pigment epithelial loss, um, loss of vascular flow, and ultimately, the RPE cells, the retinal pigment epithelial cells, support the photoreceptors. So when they die, then the photoreceptors die, and neither are regenerative. So whatever you lose is gone forever in that regard. You can't get it back. That's why prevention is key. Uh, Kurt Smith from Atlanta. Uh, I have a personal theory. After watching uh, the study of um, uh, metabolic disorder in the American Heart Association and the uh, American Diabetics Association, we still see low-fat diet brochures uh, in their uh, 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 waiting rooms and being handed out by doctors. Um, and we, uh, we know so much research that if the right information was, was put out there, that the number of patients for those doctors would drop like a rock. Now, it would be an interesting experiment, and I'm wondering what your, what your theory is. What will the American Eye Doctors Association uh, recommend be put out in the uh, waiting rooms of uh, ophthalmologists? Will it be uh, the same information that we should be seeing in the Heart Doctors Associations? Or will they not disseminate information because they know it'll drop patients like a rock? Great question. <clears throat> I really don't know the answer to that because um, the um, um, American uh, ophthalmology Association has not taken a stand on that really at all. Um, there's uh, very little uh, recommendation regarding diet other than leafy greens uh, and 
uh, multivitamins. And beyond that, there hasn't really been a, a stance. And um, although there are 10 studies uh, before ours that made a link between vegetable, the polyunsaturated vegetable oils and the trans fats in total that have linked those strongly with macular degeneration, and yet there still is no stance about that at all. So I cannot predict at all what, what they're going to do. It's, it's unknown. Nothing. Probably. Probably. All right, this might be a little redundant from the first question, but I wonder, could you expound at all on a possible mechanism by which like these polyunsaturated fats could be contributing to AMD? I know like you lose the RPE layer and that's, uh, you know, that is the, like the overall, you know, symptomatic part of the disease. But do you have any uh, idea if you were just to speculate <laughs> what right. that might be that, the, that they're actually doing? Yeah, absolutely. Another great question. I think the polyunsaturates, play a huge role in the vascular disease um, at the choroid vessels, which are the lar larger ones, and the choriocapillaris, just like they do in heart disease and vascular disease. Um, they play a massive role there. And then, of course, they're displacing the animal fats where we would get the vitamin K2, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're displacing butter, lard, beef tallow, but where we, so we're missing the vitamin K2, and so then, I think the second factor is that these, just speculation, but I believe the polyunsaturates play a role in the thickening of Brooks' membrane that creates a barrier between the choriocapillaris and the, and the ultimately the photoreceptors. So um, that's basically it in a nutshell. Okay, so would you expect to see like a worsening of, or AMD to be earlier onset like in diseases like the, like uh, hypercholesterolemia or any other disease that actually would affect like the um, blood flow to the to the macula would you, would that be expected or is that observed at all because it sounds um, like it's possible like it just like the blood flow is is part of the issue right just that uh, right. the feeding the rpe layer right i don't think there's uh, a good uh, any good studies that draw a correlation between the cholesterol levels well, it's and just been like it, some some people have more like arthrosclerosis or anything. I mean, you show all these all this correlation between hypertension, diabetes. We know those are all um, you know going to be related. But I wonder if there was any uh, genetic you know diseases specifically that led to AMD that would cause like vasoconstriction or anything that would affect the RPE um, being fed by the vasculature. Well, there's definitely studies that are connecting heart disease. Uh, you know, coronary vascular disease and disease of the carotid arteries to macular degeneration. No question about that. Those are, those are strongly linked, but I think that's as far as it goes. Okay, thank you. Sure. I have a simple question. Is it reversible at all? Is it reversible? Mm -hmm. Now, I've seen at least nine patients result, re reverse the early stages of drusen uh, which is where the metabolic deposits occur. So I think when you begin really early, you're, you can reverse the beginning stages, but you certainly cannot reverse the fact that if you have already lost retinal pigment epithelial cells and photoreceptors, the, you know, the rods and cones, those are non-regenerative. And so once you've lost vision, that won't be coming back. Uh, you know, I, they're certainly, we're seeing patients, anecdotal reports, who are going to their, they're changing their diets based on this and going back to their ophthalmologist, and they are seeing better, but, and we're seeing that they are losing some of those drusen, these metabolic deposits. But in general, I would say you're not going to see a great recovery from somebody that has moderate. Or more, or more advanced macular degeneration, that won't happen. Okay. Stem cells, they're using those? I, no. The question's about stem cells, and the, I, I don't think there's any data there yet. Thank you. Okay, okay one last question. Is there anything you can say about glaucoma? About glaucoma? Yeah. I mean. It's a bad disease. <laughs> <laughs> you mean in relation to diet? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I think that, um, oh, well, this is very uh, off the cuff because it's not my area of research, but in general, I think that our diet is driving glaucoma in the same way would be my knee-jerk reaction, but I have not investigated that, and that, that's a, and, and there's many, many kinds of glaucoma, so the open angle glaucomas, um, yeah, I think that it could play a very big role, and the low tension or normal pressure type of glaucomas, I think the vascular flow there is so critical and such a big factor that, yes, I think this plays a role in, in glaucoma, but nobody has gone down the path of, of you know, investigating that like we did for macular degeneration. Hasn't been done.